Mark Milfrich may know who his uh, quarterback is right now, but the rest of the world doesn't uh, exactly know who that Oregon starter is going to be in week one. We uh, talk about it with uh, Jack Fullman from Pacific Takes to break down Oregon football top to bottom. And, of course, uh, Jack, uh, we're just a one week away, so it all starts at quarterback with Marcus Mariota, the Heisman Trophy winner, off to the NFL. And uh, ironically, he was the top uh, efficiency passer in college football last year. And you bring in uh, uh, the Ducks, bring in Vernon Adams uh, from Eastern Washington as a senior transfer who was the FCS's top efficiency quarterback uh, at that level last year. So it's Jeff Lockey, the junior with the experience in the program versus uh, Vernon Adams. So, so what's your take at this point? Boy, it's uh, not much coming out of uh, Eugene from fall camp this year. Uh, it's uh, got a, They have a pretty tight lid on what's been going on. But from what I can read, it seems like it's completely neck and neck. And I thought Lockie had a really good chance to kind of edge out uh, Adams, even though most people kind of already handed it to it, the job to him once he uh, announced that he was coming to Eugene. But it took him so long to get there. He only got there a couple weeks ago uh, because of academic issues that – it seemed like Lockie might pull it out, but right now I think if, since they brought in Adams, I would be shocked if he didn't start at this point, especially without much of a word uh, either way at this point. Yeah, without seeing too much of these two players, at least at this level, of course Adams has played a ton. Uh, he seems to be the ceiling guy, the guy with the, the big arm and with the athletic ability where uh, Lockie's been in the system and uh, knows Oregon's uh, offense. Uh, so I'm sure he would be more than serviceable and win a ton of games. But, of course, this team and this program is expected to win championships. Uh, offensive skill all over the place, even with the injuries, Jack, that this program has suffered at the skill position players over the last uh, year or so with Devin Allen. He's had an ACL. Uh, Darren Carrington, uh, top playmaker, has been um, – been out tight end Farrow Brown. We don't know if he's completely healthy. He had a knee issue last year. Uh, Thomas Tyner, of course, the huge loss. Uh, and you're ta- you're looking at three running backs uh, now with Byron Marshall basically moving to wide receiver that have been so successful. And that that kind of speaks to the talent here that uh, that uh, a Byron Marshall gets pushed to wide receiver because Royce Freeman's so good and and Thomas Tyner before he got hurt, uh, Braylon Addis- Addison coming off an ACL. So there's just droves of talented players, both at running back and wide receiver. Can can you give us some a feel for how you see this shaking out in regards to who's going to be the main targets and the in the main uh, uh, ball carriers? Yeah, as you said, uh, injuries have really kind of shaken things up, but luckily for uh, Oregon, they've uh, been well prepared with stacking a lot of depth at running back and receiver. I mean, I don't think there's any question, especially uh, with Tyner now out for the year, that uh, Royce Freeman is going to be, you know, just a workhorse for that for that offense. I and mean, he looks like a guy who uh, could already be a first-round NFL draft pick as, with a guy with that much size, speed, and strength. He's Losing Tyner is only just going to make them rely on him more, and it sounds like they might have a, a freshman uh, in Griffin who can kind of add a little bit more bounce uh, when they need to get to someone else. At receiver and tight end, it's the same situation where they have just as much depth and talent as uh, anyone in the conference, maybe in the in the country, even with their injuries. And I think Addison, getting Braylon Addison back is going to be huge, and he's going to be that speedster guy for them. Uh, coming off an injury that's going to, you know, help ease the pain of maybe not having Devon Allen up to speed or uh, Darren Carrington, who might have a suspension issue as well. I'm uh, going to throw in Byron Marshall, who, uh, you know, is a rare kind of guy who can be a, a thousand yard receiver and a running back. Uh, he, he had a huge game and the, the championship game was one of their few players in offense that uh, really lived up to his potential, and he's going to have another great year, I think. And I also wouldn't be surprised to see him uh, carry the ball a little bit more with uh, Tom, Thomas Tyner not not ready to go. Overall, though, I think just both running back and receiver, tight end, those skill positions, no one's no one's better than Oregon in the conference right now, so they don't have too much to worry about. Yeah, again, I think it underscores the talent and depth there when. 
I had Byron Marshall rated uh, two years ago going into the season as one of the 10 best running backs in college football, and now he sees himself at wide receiver. Uh, Hronis Grassu moves on to the NFL. The offensive line has uh, more than more than any been the forerunner of the the sleeker, uh, more mobile, more athletic offensive lines, and that's been the calling card for this offensive line. Uh, where, where do we stand uh, up front? There's a lot of losses up front, but as a lot of people who followed Oregon for a while know, no, no program in the country is better at next man up where, you know, they lose all no American, but they bring in a guy you've never heard of. And that next guy, you know, he plays really well. And I think that offensive line is uh, what I kind of expect to come from them next year. There's a couple of uh, key factors though with the offensive line. One is uh, the grad transfer out of Notre Dame is Matt Haggerty. I think he's going to replace Hans Grassu. I don't think he's going to be a Grassu up there for him in his one year, but he's going to be a solid guy who can uh, really, you know, help that transition. And then also uh, Tyler Johnstone at a tackle. He, uh, I think, tore two ACLs in, a, in about the span of about nine months and missed all of last year. Uh, so, but the big factor with him is that supposedly in the first day of uh, fall camp, he went down with an injury as well. I uh, haven't heard much about that. As you know, uh, teams are pretty quiet about injuries in camp. Uh, I think no one maybe more than that in Oregon. So if he can come back and be full uh, full steam ahead, he can be the best lineman in the Pac-12. But at the same time, you really have to worry about a guy who's had so many injuries uh, not you know coming back at full strength. Uh, those are kind of the two big factors. Other than that, you know, the Ducks are going to have to really have that next man philosophy because they have a couple holes in that offensive line where they don't have, you know, maybe the talent they've had in prior years stepping in. Jack Fullman joining us from Pacific takes uh, the defense gets a little credit, Jack, as you well know, considering uh, the dynamic offense, a uh, little credit for this glittering record that the ducks have compiled over the last five or six seasons, but uh, they, they've uh, regularly rated and ranked near the the top of the Pac-12 in yardage and points allowed, and have and have uh, really done the job on that side of the ball. Defensive coordinator Don Pelham has gained a little criticism for being a bit conservative. Uh, they they don't get into the backfield maybe as much as people would like. Uh, Eric Armstead moves on to the NFL, but many people consider DeForest Buckner, who chose to stay, to be even better. So let's start there uh, with Buckner in the defensive end position, of course. You joined us for a number of top five breakdowns across the Pac-12 that was littered with uh, with Oregon players on both sides of the ball, and and Buckner included. Yeah, Buckner is just another one of those guys, uh, you know, kind of like uh, Mariota, Grassu, and Ekbert Allen last year, who came back uh, when he could have been a really high draft choice. Uh, he's without question probably going to be the best defensive lineman in the Pac-12 and really be an anchor for them up there. Even though he's uh, on the end and not a tackle, he's just Six seven two ninety five and can uh, rush the passer and also really hold up against the run with that uh, with that size. He's just kind of everything for them on that line. Not to say they don't have another really good guy up there in Alex Balducci, who's kind of your uh, your blue collar uh, undersung hero at the tackle, who's uh, also really big and kind of more of that guy who's going to hold in tight there and stop the run. Uh, they also have a some a freshman coming in and a Canton Kamatule who's kind of looks like the next DeForest Buckner as a 6'7", 290 guy who is uh, versatile with the speed to hold up against the run and the size, I mean, size to hold up against the run and the speed passer. If he can come in and be an instant attack guy, uh, that might be their three guys, you know, up front that kind of hold it up for them. As you know, Jack, a linebacker, they've got a number of players, uh, in regards to experience and depth there. So they, so they have waves of players. They seem to be pretty solid at linebacker. It's not going to be a, a guys that we necessarily know um, that, that are stars in college football, but, but a lot of guys with experience who have been productive. Yeah, it's kind of I would call a typical Oregon linebacker group. There's no Miles Jack or Scooby Ryan or Sue Cravens, but there's a lot of guys whose names you recognize who just and they make the play when it's there. A uh, perfect example was a guy like Joe Walker, uh, who's a senior, or who was a guy last year who uh, picked up the ball and Utah's Caleb Clay uh, let go of it before he got in the end zone and ran it back for a touchdown. That's the kind of players they always seem to have a linebacker. They're not, you know, they're not first round draft picks. They're not all Americans, but they just don't leave any plays on the table. Similar to a 
Rodney Hardrick, who's the same thing. He's a really big guy. I think he's around 240, 250, who uh, you've seen before. He's a uh, uh, he's blocked punts, I think, blocked kicks or punts for touchdowns. He's just kind of the guys who do everything and uh, don't make mistakes. In the secondary, uh, Oregon does produce uh, some of the best in the land uh, and have for a number of years. Ifo, Ekre, uh, Olamu, obviously he was lost down the stretch and that hurt them uh, in the championship game. Uh, he's gone to the NFL. Uh, the, the secondary, can you size up the secondary for us? Secondary is almost completely a rebuilding project. Uh, as you mentioned, they lost Ekpre Olamu, but at, almost more important to me is they lost Eric Dargan, who is their safety, and they also lost another cornerback. Uh, his name escapes me at the, the moment. I apologize, but he uh, he stepped in for Ekpre Olamu, and I honestly thought that they didn't miss a beat uh, as well, even though he wasn't the uh, the NFL type player I projected to be. Uh, so, yeah, they're going to have a lot of new faces back there. They have one returner, uh, Reggie Daniels, who's a, a good solid safety, uh, kind of like the linebackers. I don't think he's uh, an All-American or anything, but he's a good solid presence on there, going to make a lot of tackles. Other than that, at the quarterback position, there's going to be a lot of young guys, including Charles Nelson, who was a receiver last year and uh, was one of the fastest players on the Oregon team, which, you know, uh, says a lot about it, how fast somebody is, and you can say that. Uh, he's going to be in that mix to kind of be guys who I think they'll throw out early in the season and see who can play the best in live action, uh, and they hope kind of get better as the year goes on because they're going to have to start from, uh, you know, scratch back there. There's that stereotype, Jack, that uh, Oregon's so brash that uh, on offense they just go, go, go. If it's fourth down, you go for it. If you score a touchdown, you go for it too. You, you get it 8 nothing out of the gate. Well, Aiden Schneider did hit on 11 and 12 field goals, so that's been a bugaboo in the past. Uh, I don't know if the field goal kicking has been as bad as national perception, but obviously the misses have been uh, noticeable in big games against big opponents, but Schneider coming back off an, an 11 for 12 uh, season in 2014. They pay the return trip to East Lansing against Michigan State. That's a game that I think just about all of us need to see. Uh, I can't wait for that game in week two. Uh, considering uh, the Pac-12 being stacked, although they're in the weaker of the two divisions, because of Pac-12 scheduling being so balanced that you have to play nine of the 11, it almost doesn't totally matter what division you're in. You're going to see almost everybody from the other division anyway, so they don't miss too much in terms of scheduling. It's pretty tough. Again, the trip to Michigan State, the lack of a proven quarterback at this level. So so how do you size up the Ducks? Where do you predict them to finish? Uh, predict them? I definitely predict them to win the North. I don't see any question about that. It's The only question is really uh, – how can they win the whole conference, and are they going to be able to get, get into the playoffs? Uh, going to the conference, I really like their schedule uh, inside the Pac-12 because they miss UCLA, um, they miss Arizona, who's given them a lot of trouble, and they get USC at home, and they get Utah at home. So of that f big five-pack in the south of really good teams, uh, they miss two of them, they get two at home, and they only have one road game at Arizona State, who they've played pretty well uh, in recent history. So I don't see any problems with them getting out of the North. And I think if they get to the championship game in the, in the Pac-12, I think they'd be favored. And I, uh, I don't see anyone in the South who I'd honestly bet on beating them. But at the same time, you kind of got to wonder uh, when uh, this Oregon team program, I guess, overall, is just going to kind of, you know, come down to earth a little bit. But I wouldn't bet against them. With that kind of stuff said, as, as far as them not being a playoff team, not being a Pac-12 championship team, I always say I'll believe it when I see it. Uh, that's kind of what I'm holding on to. So right now, I think they uh, win the Pac-12 North. Uh, I would say they probably win the Pac-12 championship, and they get into that playoff again, maybe right on the edge with maybe a loss at Michigan State, uh, maybe a hiccup somewhere in the Pac-12 against someone just because, you know, they don't have – a player like Mariota anymore and sheer odds, I guess. Yeah, they don't have the tradition. Uh, they don't have the name, but if you're just looking at current college football and what's transpired in the last five or six years, it's certainly been an elite program that is only void of wrapping up that national championship. But when it comes to winning consistently in arguably the best conference right now in college football and winning 11 and 12 and 13 games a year, 
Oregon's about as good as it gets. I certainly know they have their detractors out there uh, uh, at times in the way they have branded themselves and put themselves out there. But it's a it's a fun program to watch and and it's a fun team to watch on the field, Jack. Yeah, for sure. All right, Jack. Jack Fullman from uh, Pacific Takes. Uh, love the breakdown on Oregon, Jack. Thanks so much. Of course. Thanks for having me on.